see if anybody comes on and then I will begin. Oh my god, David, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> Good to see you. Locked by Anne, glad you're joining. Thank you, thank you very much. Good. All right, how is everybody? Yeah, waving back at you, my friend, for sure. Uh, hello, D. Thank you for joining. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Happy Monday. Happy Monday, I think. <laughs> Let me turn down my music here. So, uh, all right. <clears throat> so, how are you guys all doing? Good to see you too, my friend. Uh, I saw you, uh, your post with your, your bed. <laughs> so you decided not to paint the walls. That's good. Hey, Julie, how are you? All right. Well, you know, I haven't been on live in uh, quite a while. I've done a lot of uh, posts, brain smokes, and, uh, you know, other things like that. But I haven't done a live in quite some time. And I felt it was needed. I wanted to, to come on and, first of all, see how everyone is. And uh, let you know that, yeah, I'm still... I'm still around. We are celebrating the end of our first month of being back open here in California. So, uh, you know, we were open, shut down, then open again. It'll happen. It's just going to be a while. Yeah, I know how that is, my friend. I know how that is. So uh, hopefully you guys are doing well. Hopefully uh, you're maintaining. Your clients are returning to you again. And that's, that's all good. That's very, very important. Uh, tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what I call celebrating the power of applied knowledge. So I have a question for you uh, tonight. I want you to finish this statement for me. Power is, I'm sorry, <laughs> screwed that up. Knowledge is, what's the end of that statement? Knowledge is what? I'll wait for somebody to give me the answer. Knowledge is nobody. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sure we're familiar with the statement that, hey, thank you very much. You're exactly right. Knowledge is power. So here's what I, I, I'm going to suggest to you tonight. I'm going to suggest to you that there was a word missing from that a statement originally. And this, the word that was missing was applied knowledge as power. And so what do I mean by that? Well, here's what happens. I find that, you know, we attend a lot of education. You do online education. You've done live education <clears throat> and all of that. And you, you, you have lots of content coming into you. And you're probably taking copious notes and doing all of that stuff. But for many of us in this industry, it stops there. So I've taken the notes, I've listened to the information, that's it. But that's really, that's really not taking it to where it really needs to be. We need to take it that extra step and we need to apply that information in the salon with our clients when we're working. If it's a new behavior, we need to at least try that behavior over and over. I always say it, try it 10 times before you throw it away. And I find that sometimes in our industry, we choose to, we have lots of content, but we don't have a lot of real life experiences actually applying that content. And tonight I wanted to, first of all, thank, uh, there's several of you on here tonight that have taken the information that I've shared and you've actually tested it and you actually have applied it and you validate it yourself, and that is why now you own that information. You know, I can take you back years ago before probably many of you were in the industry when I first started talking about testing colors, you know, and doing dye outs and all of that. You have to understand the industry didn't do that before. And when I started talking to hairdressers about testing their colors and dyeing out their colors to find out what the color really was, People said, no, you don't have to do that. Why would you do that? And now today you see not only the information that I've shared, but there are other educators that are now using that same information in their classes as well because they find it beneficial and they find it 
that it really does make people aware of the products that they use. And so that's what I mean by applying the knowledge that we learn. Here's what we know in education. We know that if I can get the student to understand why the information is important, and then I can give them the information, and then they can apply that information, it then becomes, they own that. That becomes part of their information. And it's not having to try to tell someone what should be. It becomes, they own it. They truly believe it. And it avoids a lot of what I consider urban legends that have been created in our industry and actually still are kind of hanging out <laughs> in our industry. Um, as you've heard me say before, I get frustrated sometimes when I go on social media and or when I watch some of these programs in forums and I hear the information and I go, well, that's not accurate. And what it does is it creates a false narrative in the mind of the learner. And, and we in this industry like to do broad strokes. In other words, we like to give them sayings. Like here was a saying that you probably have taught if you're a trainer and watching me, you've taught this in your color class. You say, the further away you are with the color you're using, the less control you have over warmth. And so that's the rule, right? That's the whole phrase. And so, People say, well, okay, so what does that really mean? Because it doesn't really have a meaning unless you explain why. Unless you explain that if you're using a lighter shade, it has less pigment. If you're trying to refine warmth and you're trying to lighten a darker shade, you don't have enough pigment in your color to actually compensate for the warmth that hair is going to contribute. So now that's the why. And I find that it's kind of like the way the human brain works. I mean, we all have our own style of learning. And um, some of us, you know, we need to know the why. So I, I'm a why guy. <laughs> you know, I want to know why is that important to know? Why did that happen the way that it did? You've heard me tell, tell you my story about beauty school when the, the instructor said, White light reflected through a three-sided prism breaks into the visible spectrum. And I said, how does that do that? And she said, don't ask me how or don't ask me why. Just memorize it. And that's the way I learned color when I was in beauty school, which was eons ago. The sad thing is, that's the way a lot of people still learn color. So you have people who have to know the why. They have to have a background. One of the things that I've learned, because sometimes I go down rabbit trails because I love the chemistry and hair color, not everyone has the same understanding of hair or hair color. So when I use a language that's different than theirs, for example, um, when I lighten hair, I call it creating more reflect, less light absorption, because that's what you do. Uh, in our language, in hairdressing language, we call that lift. See, so I don't refer to it the same way. So unless someone has a background, they understand what I'm talking about. Sometimes on the person who has no foundation, the information is lost. And so I, as a trainer, have had to really rethink the way I articulate information so that people understand it because my assumption as a trainer was that everybody knew this. That everybody knew that the cuticle was seven to ten layers. I assumed everybody knew that. But everybody doesn't. <laughs> I assume that everyone knew about the natural lipids that hold the cuticle edges of the cuticle layers down. That that's that intercellular cement. But people don't know that. I assumed that everybody knew that peroxide punched holes in the cuticle, <laughs> but not everybody knew that. So as a trainer, I had to rethink the way that I said things and think about, first of all, setting up a foundation for people who don't understand and trying to find an analogy that will help them grab 
make more sense of it. Hi, Yvette. How are you? I see all of you joining. Thank you also for being here. I was trying to finish my train of thought. <laughs> so other people wanted to know the what. They want to know the content. Content's important to them. But content is really not beneficial unless you can put it into use. And so if I'm going to share content, I then have to have a way to help people understand how to use it or a way for them to test it. Many of you have been to my Formulation Foundations program. You know, I tell you to go buy a white cotton, you know, mix up your level sixes with 20 volume, apply it, and then, you know, test it out. And then some of them send me a note going, what should I be looking for? And I send them back a note and I go, well, tell me what you see. Because it's not what I see in your swatches, it's what you see. And it helped people kind of understand how they're trying to discover what kind of background they have in their color, you know, whether or not um, they have a, a, enough tone in their color that they're looking for. All of these things are things that we have to own when we're a student by completing the exercise. So completing these exercises are not really for me. They're really for the person who's learning from me. I'm just trying to give you ways so that you can own that information. But it helps you then master hair color and understand that there's more variables in it than we really think about. And it avoids a lot of these urban legends, okay? Such as the one as I, I, that I was saying. Um, the urban legend about, you know, the molecular size of dye. <laughs> you know, the blue dye molecule is tiny. The red dye molecule is fat. And that's not true. <laughs> dye intermediates are all pretty much the same size. And you actually really don't have a dye molecule until the color penetrates and migrates to the cortex of the hair and all of the precursors and couplers and modifiers mix together and create an actual dye molecule. So there's so many little pieces that we have to test to verify. And that's what I always suggest that you do. You know, it's like you saw my post just the other day with bleach and direct dyes. Okay, so I, I showed you, I put a direct dye in a bowl of bleach and within a matter of 10 minutes, the direct dye was gone because bleach is a decomposing product. That's what it does. It eats up whatever is around it. So some of these things I think help us when we're working with hair color to understand. Uh, but again, we put them in blanket terms. You know, it's uh, like one, I, I guess I was there in the beginning of this when we were teaching people that lift, that's what we call it, lift is really determined by two things, not one, but two. You know, peroxide, we always gave credit for lift. But then we tried to get people to understand that it was the alkalinity and the hair color that determine how much oxygen peroxide would release and therefore the color played an important role as well. So here's the common rule that came out of that. The lift is in the tube. And <laughs> the lift's not in the tube. You know, the tube in and of itself will not lighten your hair. The peroxide is what breaks down the structure of the hair. The environment is created by the tube of color. So based upon the alkalinity and the hair color that I'm using, it will determine how much oxygen peroxide will release into the mixture. That's huge because I, I don't want to take credit away from what peroxide does. I've done the test and some of the direct dyes still remain in the bowl. Scary. Yes. Well, um, as you know, um, we pull a lot of different dyes from a lot of different worlds in order to make hairdressers happy. And so if the direct dyes stay in the bowl, uh, that could be disconcerting. Could be disconcerting. Does bleach expire? If you mean like 
powdered bleach does it expire? Um, I don't think as long as there's not a, a, a change in moisture levels, you know, like I, I would imagine if you put a bleach somewhere where it absorbed a lot of moisture, that would activate some of those persulfate salts and it would possibly shorten the life of the powder. That's the reason that they put powder in a plastic bag. <laughs> you know, number one, so you can keep it. It's an anti-humectant, anti-humidifier. It, it keeps the bleach from being exposed to too much moisture. It's also used today because we use um, because we use um, <clears throat> bleaches that are um, lightweight. Okay, that are you know that do not have. Um, they don't create a puffiness or a smoke. We we have ingredients in there that have to be kneaded, meaning that it has to be moved around. So that plastic that uh, that plastic bag is used to knead the bleach and mix it up and keep it active. Because in uh, bleaches that are dust free, if they set on the shelf too long, the active ingredients sometimes will settle at the bottom of the container. So that's why I always say. Keep your bag, okay, and knead it regularly. Or if you if you just keep your container, occasionally shake it. And if you walk by it and you wonder if you've sh shaken it in the last few days, shake it anyway. And that will keep the ingredients active. Because if you just let it set static and you keep scooping off the top, sometimes you'll get a variation in your lightning in the product. Lift is... In the tube lift is not in the tube no I didn't say it well I did say that lift is not in the tube the tube doesn't lighten hair if you take a tube of hair color <laughs> and you lay it on a hair strand you can leave it there for two days it will not lighten the hair the tube, the the color itself creates an environment okay that environment encourages peroxide to release oxygen. The longer that the environment, Dennis, not a color question, but wondering what the science is. I have made, I have a male client that wears CPAP headgear, okay, and his hair has a permanent dent in it, meaning even after washing, it is still there. Wow, David. Um, David, I'll have to do some research on that. I, I don't know why that would be other than it's possible that if he's been wearing a CPAP headgear for a long period of time, um, you know, it, the hair might be starting to naturally grow that way. I don't know. I would have to check and see for you. I don't really have a good answer. So... Um, so let me get back to color. Again, the, the, the color sets up the environment. The, the longer the hair stays in an alkaline state, which is totally dependent on the color, the more oxygen peroxide releases, and the more oxygen peroxide releases, the lighter it makes the hair. That's the way hair color works. The only reason that I'm coming back now and saying, wait a minute, the lift's not in the color, is so that we understand that peroxide really does create the lift. Because sometimes I take a lighter level of color and I take a low vo volume of developer, a low percentage of developer, and I will really just simply want to, I'm, I'm going to start to finesse how much lift I can actually create. I've got alkalinity to work with, so once I have a big window of alkalinity, I can now control how much lightning action I create in the hair based upon the volume of developer that I'm using. So if I use five volume and a high level of color, I'll get more than one level of lift, but it's not going to go extremely far because I have a very small amount of oxygen to release. So, so now you can start really manipulating your mixture when you're formulating your hair color. So th these are some of the things that we just consider to be common and yet they're kind of misleading sometimes. So when you're doing great coverage and you apply color direct on the hair, you're creating the environment. Yes, high five to you. That's exactly what you're doing. 
the alkalinity and the color is swelling or softening is the word we use. Swelling is what's actually happening. It's swelling the cuticle layer and creating an optimum environment so that you can now apply your color and the hair will accept the color more successfully. That's why I say in great coverage, um, when you have the timer goes off, check at the end of your process. And if you didn't get good coverage in any specific area, simply take an additional mixture of the same formula only with a low percentage developer because you don't need developer now. Okay, and apply it right over the top of what's on that head. That hair is already pre-softened and it will accept the color more readily. Okay. Uh, I have seen some people teach theory. Uh, oh, Lord, they need to stop. You're the, oh, thank you very much. Um, what do you think about the bleach from Redken that looks like laundry small packets? Um, so the first time I saw that was today, actually. Um, I think it's interesting. I, I, I think it's just... A, I'm sorry. I'm so simple about these things. I just go, it's a bleach. So I don't think there's anything magical about it. Um, I'm not sure what happens. From what I should see on the video, I guess they drop it in the bowl and they apply developer right in there. They don't take the packets off of it. I guess the packets disintegrate, I guess. Um, but I really can't speak to that because I've not used the product. But of all the bleaches I've used in all the years that I've been around, it's all powder. It's all powder. Um, they all have a great story, and stories are great because that's the purpose of making a product. I want you to buy my product. Oh, it's for convenience, pre-measured for convenience. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, as a colorist, I really need to have it in packets because sometimes, sometimes I use my bleach very small amounts. Sometimes I use large amounts. Um, but it all depends. You know, we're, we're an interesting breed of people. If you could go back and look at all the things in your careers that you have bought because they were cool, and yet you're not using them today. <laughs> why? Why aren't, if they were that cool, why aren't you still using them? Because it was part of the marketing of the product. Nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what is it and how does it work? And we all have our own belief systems and our own choices about that. Tips for treating the hairline when coloring. Lower developer or go up a level. Um, I would actually go, if, if your hairline has a tendency to go darker, I would, I would have a ten, I would lighten, I would go up a level. And here's why. That hair around the front of the hairline is fine hair. Fine hair is going to take color more dramatically. So if I go to a lighter level, then I have a better chance of the color coming out with an even tonality to front to back. Another option would be uh, apply everything to the entire head except for the one eighth of an inch right around the front of the hairline. And then when, and this also avoids you creating that artificial hairline and staining the skin. Then I take a dry color brush and I push it from the front into the back, from the front into the back. And then it's going to process on there. Uh, I'll, I'll probably process that a little bit shorter time. So I'm still going to get that little variation. It's going to come closer to matching what the rest of the hair looks like. But more than anything else, I would probably lighten the level on that front if it took darker. Uh, it's shiny and new. Tips for breaking the hairline when coloring lower developer or go up a level. Go up a level. Okay, great. Well, thanks for all these questions. That's great. Because, again, there's so many opinions in this business, you know. Um, and it's kind of crazy what, what, people, what people come up with. Um, even on technique. Even on technique sometimes, you know. I'll watch some of these techniques where they're going to do a color melt, and they're going to use three colors. And so they paint the first color at the scalp area. 
they paint the second color, they paint the third color, and then, then they take a comb <laughs> and they comb the color through from the scalp to the end. So they drag a comb through all three of those colors. Well, when you do that, you're actually creating one color. So sometimes the things you know that we do, we need to ask people about that. There's a little saying I believe in. I'm going to make sure I read it here for you. So the problem is that the, we're not the problem. Okay, it's not that people are uneducated. The problem is that they are educated just enough to believe what they're taught, and not educated enough to question what they've been taught. So what I'm suggesting that you do is question what you've been taught, if you have a question about it. If they can't answer it, or if they get condescending, then you probably know they don't know the answer anyway. But most importantly, you need to feel comfortable with that information. And really, it's quite, if we, if we just understand how color works, it makes our life so much easier. I feel bad. I set up a live for 9 p.m. Please don't feel I'm being rude. David, I know. I'm sorry. I saw your notice. I saw your notice earlier. No worries, my friend. I'll probably jump on yours in a little while. <laughs> um, if I leave the root touch up on gray hair too long, can it cause hot roots? No. Um, it all depends on how you formulate, how you formulate that. So if you're doing just a normal retouch on gray hair, and that's the only place that you're, you're doing it, it's not a virgin application, leaving it longer will not cause it to become warmer, um, will not cause any degrading of the pigment unless you're using a high volume of developer. If you're using a high volume of developer on the scalp area, that could cause some problems because of the higher the volume, the quicker it develops the dyes. So if you take two bowls and you mix a color with 20 volume in one bowl and a color with 40 volume in the other, as you watch the color oxidize, the 40 volume bowl will oxidize much faster because you're releasing a tremendous amount of oxygen. But at the end of the day, when you wash that off the hair, the 40 volume formula will be brighter than the 20 volume formula. Why? Because while it's developing the dyes quicker, it's all dis also destroying a lot of the dye intermediates that are in the bowl. I call that non-effective pigment loss, meaning that when you mix a color in your bowl, you're automatically going to lose pigment during the color process. So when you mix peroxide and color together in the bowl, the development begins immediately. And you can see the cream as it starts to get darker. That's dye development. Those are partially developed dye molecules that are already partially developed. So when you paint those on the hair, they probably will never get to the cortex. They will probably only get stuck in and around the cuticle layers. And um, those will be, what unless you do a great post-oxidation at the end of your color service, those are what will cause early fading. So if you're using a, a, a moderate volume of developer on that scalp area, there should be no reason for that scalp area to be brighter if you extend the processing time. So um, I don't see any issue with that at all. We do know that that scalp area is what we call soft keratinized protein. It's, it's more cellular tissue. It's in transition from cellular tissue to fibril tissue, and it is more tender. But if you're processing it in a normal ratio, it should have no problem at all. Okay. So hopefully that answered your question for that. So the thing to keep in mind is always, you know, make sure that when we're learning information that we're asking ourselves, number one, why is this information important for me? Number two, what is the information? What's the actual information? What's the truth about the information? 
Can you talk about timing the color? Is it from when you begin or when you place the last bit? Recently have heard from the start. Okay. Your timing starts from the moment of your last application. Now, if you take a long time to apply, let's imagine that she has enough hair for a small village. So your application time takes longer. I always mix as I go. So I'll mix a, a, a mix of color for the back region of the head. And then I'll mix another batch of color for the sides of the head. Now here's why I'll do that. Because dye development occurs. And if I am trying to maintain a successful color throughout the head, I'm going to mix as I go, especially if I have lots of hair to get through or if I am slow with my application. So processing time begins at the immediate mixing of developer and color. So that's development. It's happening. That's why I always say, you know, mix as you go if you want the best results. A lot of people will take and in foil placement, they'll use high levels of blonde, high lift blonde. And they'll try to use the same high lift blonde through the entire head and they'll put in 150 foils. Well, at the front of the head, the same lifting power or lightning power is not going to be in that solution any longer because a high lift blonde usually has a peak working action of about 45 minutes. So your maximum lightning action in that product is going to be setting at the 45 minute window. So if at 30 minutes you still have part of that head to do, I say mix another batch of color, mix as you go. And that way you're working with fresh product all the time, especially when you're trying to achieve lift and especially when you're trying to achieve good deposit. What causes banding on white hair? Color looks good when the client leaves, yes. But when she returns, there's that light streak, right? Right at like the regrowth that grew out, there's that banding. Okay, well, normally that is from... That's resistant gray hair. So what has happened is that when you did your color application the first time, the development seemed to be okay. But remember, gray hair can have anywhere from 14 to 16 layers of cuticle. The average head of hair has 7 to 10. So even the, initially, it's going to look like it all covered well, especially at the scalp area. But that scalp area still has some retention of moisture in it. That's why we say it's just transitioning from cell tissue to fibril tissue. So it's going to look good there. But then when she comes back, what you're going to find is that you're going to find that light band. That means from that, that half an inch that you did, okay, from the mids and the ends, it looks really good. It looks fine. But that half inch, as it grew out, it lost color faster because there was so much cuticle, you didn't have enough coverage. So if I have that happening, I'm going to change the way I formulate my color when I do her retouch. And I'm probably going to shift my color formulation. And here's what a color shift formula is. It is three parts of color to two parts of developer. So I'm going to shift it when I apply it that scalp area. And that way I am, one, changing the alkalinity slightly higher, and I have more pigment to work with. Hope that helped you. But yes, that's that all famous band that comes back to you. I learned mix as you go from you. Thank you very much. Yes, it does change everything. It makes you more on point. How long should it take me to apply? Ugh. Well, it depends on the head, but you should get an application on the head within an average application within 15 minutes. I mean, I would think, yeah, 15 minutes or, or faster, but 15 minutes for a regular retouch application. Uh, why gray hair has more cuticle layers? Why? <laughs> because it's the way of the human body. Here's what happens. Our body stops producing an amino acid called tyrosine. So tyrosine is responsible for the pigmentation in your body and in your hair. So your skin pigment and your hair pigment, all because of tyrosine. That's why you notice is that when people get older, 
not only do they lose color in their hair, they lose color in their skin. All right, so tyrosine, our body stops producing that at a period of time, which is totally dependent upon genetics and your body. And <clears throat> when that happens, the cells are still being delivered to the base of the hair follicle, but they're not being used for pigment. They're now being converted into cuticle. And you know those kind of clients that have resistant cuticle. That's that gray hair that grows out of the head and it looks like a tree branch. So it has little branches off the edges of it. In fact, it's the, the hair you can't get to lay down nicely. You put your cream on it and the hair pops through the cream. You put more cream. Some people try to put permanent wave uh, papers on it to hold it down. That's resistant gray hair. And that's why, you know, there are certain things that are part of the way the human body is created. I mean, I, was, I did a class today and we were talking about pigment in the hair. And I was explaining to the students that the pigment development in our hair is determined by that amino acid tyrosine. And it's completely random. What that means is that some hair may have more pigment granules than another hair. So one hair strand might have a lot of pigment granules. One hair may not. You know, every one of you watching me right now, your virgin hair, there is... Every hair on your head is not the same color. Even though we give ourselves the broad picture, we go, hey, I got brown hair. No, you don't. You have variations. You have variations. Okay, just because it's individual and it's random. Think about it. I'll bet you, you have clients that they have hair in certain areas of their head that is half a level lighter okay, than hair in other areas of their head. It's because the way we are made, that is the human perfection. That's why I love when clients come in and they say, I want to be baby blonde. And I say, well, we don't have a baby blonde color. Okay, you know, baby blonde is not one color. It's about five different variations of dimension in blonde hair. That's how you make baby blonde hair. And so those things are important to understand. That's why it's important to understand a little bit about life science in our business, you know. How do we create color? How's color created in the hair? How does the pigment in the hair affect the end result? Uh, because one of the things that you've heard me say, if you follow me, you've heard me say it, you've heard David Peacemaker, who was just on here say, is that at the end of the day, at the end of your service, whatever the hair is contributing is always gonna be 50% of your result. So the hair plays a big role in whether or not the color comes out successfully. That's why we need to understand the hair. We also need to understand hair color. Uh, I, I will tell you that there are people who've been doing color for 30 years and still don't actually understand how hair color works because they skipped the what. Remember I said why is the first, what is second, the content, and three, number three, is the how. So they skipped right past the what, and they went to the how. I'm sure you know people like that when you go to classes. They go, I don't care about all this stuff, just show me how to do it. Okay, so when it goes sideways, because they don't know what it was, they don't know why it's happening, they don't know how to fix it. And those are the people that end up going on Facebook and logging in and going, I have a client in my chair and the hair color is going sideways. Somebody needs to help me. Give me a recipe. Give me a formula. Have you seen people do that? Give me a formula for a redhead. Why? Why would I do that? Because I don't know what your redhead looks like. I don't know what kind of hair texture she has. I don't know what color kind of skin tone she has. I remember several years ago, we were doing a class in New Orleans and a friend of mine, um, Kevin Champagne was working with us. And Kevin is a very, very, um, very in your face kind of guy. And so he was working on a model on stage. And one of the women in the audience said to him, said, that is a beautiful color. Can you give me the formula? And Kevin looked at her and he said, oh, I didn't know you knew her. And she goes, well, I don't know her. And then Kevin says, well, then why do you need her formula? <laughs> because her formula may not work 
on everybody that you, that you want to use it on because we have been trained in this industry in many cases to depend upon formulas. That's why the experts say most hairdressers use six shades of color. That's all they use. They may have a hundred shades in their back room, but they only use six. They have their favorite red, their favorite brown, their favorite blonde, their favorite beige. They have their favorite toner. They tone everybody with the same toner. How many of you know people like that? That happened to a friend of mine in Dallas, Texas. His name was Roy Peters. Roy did all the, all the wealthy women in Dallas. One day he was invited to a luncheon. And he's sitting at this luncheon. You know, he's so proud because he's doing all these ladies' hair. And he sees them all lined up at the front of the room. <laughs> and they're all the same color blonde. Seven of them. All the same color blonde. And he had an epiphany. He went, holy crap. I use the same blonde toner on everybody. So in our business... That's what we do a lot of times in this industry. We use the same formula on everyone. That's why most hairdressers only use six shades of color. That's why most hairdressers, they want to learn a recipe and then they go back and they use it and they don't do a new recipe until they learn a new recipe, until they learn a new recipe in a new class. And so we really need to step out and take control of our future. And we need to test products. We need to try new formulations. You don't have to do it on a human. If you're saying, well, what would happen if I mixed a gold and an ash? What would happen if I mixed those twos together? Would I create a really nice result? I don't know. Let me mix them together. Let me dye them out. Let me see what they look like. I found a lot of times when I was working with another color uh, company's product that I didn't want to use their natural series because I got a much more believable natural by mixing a gold and an ash family together. Kind of crazy. But it's because I did the dye outs, I understood how their colors work, and those were the formulas that I worked with. Okay, so hopefully you understand why gray hair has more cuticle. Could I also be from unclean hair? Uh, could what be from unclean hair? I don't know, Julie. Maybe you can give me that answer. Could I use Malibu Sea Shampoo pH of 9 before I color to help swell the cuticle for better gray coverage? Or is it not a high enough on the pH? Well, it's definitely high enough on the pH scale. Um, here's, the th here's the reason that you use color to pre-soften. Because you're trying to do two things. Not only you're trying to swell the cuticle, but you're also trying to impart a little bit of a base tone in that cuticle. Most of the time, if you're pre-softening prior to doing a color service, we always recommend that you pre-soften with a color that is at least two levels lighter than your target, and it's warm. Because we know gray hair contributes no warmth to the end result. So by adding a warm shade, preferably gold, of course, preferably gold, when you take gray hair, which is one part blue, one part red, and one part yellow, and you mix gold with it, which is two parts yellow and one part red. So let me repeat that. Gray hair is one blue, two red. Uh, gray hair is one blue, one red, one yellow. And you mix it with a gold shade, which is two yellows and a red, what you end up with is one blue, two reds, three yellows, you end up with a brown. So that's the reason that adding warmth in gold, especially to my gray formulas, is going to give me an extra additional amount of brown, which is going to give me a better step towards creating what we call natural hair color. So uh, yeah, you could pre-shampoo with that. Um, I really wouldn't I really wouldn't recommend it. Um, you know, I, that's why I would recommend using color because that there's a purpose for that. One of the things that's real important is to, you know, ask yourself, it's like, what's the purpose of this? Is it going to be effective in what I'm doing? In formulation, for example, how many of you know people who in every formula they put a drop of something? They have to put a, a splash or a drop of something in their formula. Now, a splash or a drop of anything 
in 60 grams of hair color or in a 60 gram mixture is really not going to do much at all. You'll be lucky if you even see it. But what it does psychologically it, it, is it makes me feel good. So I always say, ask yourself, what effect is this having on my formula? If it's not going to affect the formula, then why do it? So a lot of times when we formulate in the back room, we do it because we have second thought. We have that little voice in our head. We have second thoughts that go through our head. We go, yeah, but what if it goes off? I'm, you know, you've seen people, they put in medium brown, medium gold, little ash brown, one ribbon inch of this, one drop of that. <clears throat> and what you end up with is a bowl of pretty much mud, you know, because you can't see any of those colors. And it's really a psychological thing that we're going through. There's no, there's no real effect. So my suggestion is formulate to be effective. So most successful formulas are actually one formula. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't have to be elaborate. One formula, maybe two, maybe two and a concentrate, but that's it. You know, so if you want to create an elaborate formulation for your client, you can do the way I formulate for my clients. I don't use one color on a client. I use at least two, sometimes three on the same head of hair. I don't mix them together in the bowl. I mix them apart from each other, but I use them to sculpt, visually sculpt, and enhance the shape that I'm addressing. So I look for the high points and the low points in the design. I look for the focus points. I look for negative space. All of those things help me to apply colors that are going to help create or tell the story of that design. So to me, that's what creative formulation is. It's not putting seven colors in a bowl and they all contradict each other. And then we end up with something that we, we really didn't need. We make something and we can't see anything out of it. I'm sure you've seen people do this. They mix so many colors that they, they lose or they bury the color they were actually trying to create. They don't see the reflect because they bury it by adding so many pieces to their formula. And it all looks the same. Yeah. That's when I give up and go to my mentor. It all looks the same. Okay. Do you recommend level 10 for gray coverage? No. And here's why. Um, you have to have a certain amount of pigment in order to get coverage of gray hair. In the hair color world, we know that you have to have at least a level 8 or 10 units of pigment in order to get what we call acceptable coverage of gray hair. When you get to a level 10, you have much less pigment in your color. And because you have much less pigment in your color and because really gray hair is sort of like a blank canvas, you know, you're not going to see anything visually. Now, here's what's interesting. If you take a 10 level natural and you apply it to gray hair, you'll be lucky if you see anything. If you take a 10 level gold, if you have one, setting it gold at 10, which is kind of an, uh, an oxymoron, 10 level setting it gold, and you use that on the hair, you will see some tone. Why? Because in the world of hair color, it takes more pigment to make a level 10 gold than it does to make a level 10 ash. So what I'm sharing with you is that as your ash shades get lighter, the amount of controlling pigment becomes less. That's why sometimes, if you understand pigment weight and you've been to my classes, sometimes by using clear, I can dilute a darker shade and bring it to a lighter level. Because at each, shade, at each level, the ratio of dyes is different. So a level 7 and a level 8 are not the same color. A level 8 is not a dilution of level 7. A level 8 is a completely different color. But in my darker shades, if I have stronger pigments, and you need those in your darker shades, because that's where the most warmth is contributed as hair lightens, if I can dilute that, I can bring those stronger pigments up to a lighter level, and I can give myself more control, especially if my client has a lot of what we call pheomelanin or granulated pigment, a lot of warmth. 
in other words, she's very warm at those lighter levels, then I have more control because I'm using stronger pigments. So that's what's real important to always remember is that that's how that thing varies as we get lighter. So a level 10 is not really going to do much. Uh, I recommend a level 8. And it also depends on what you call coverage of gray. I have clients who want to see no gray at all. They want it completely wiped out. I also have clients that they don't care as long as it's got color. They just don't want to see gray. They don't, mount, they don't mind the highs and lows. They just want to not to be gray. And so it depends on what you call gray coverage. To me, gray coverage is kind of subjective based upon what your client wants and what you're trying to achieve. So that's why I wouldn't recommend a level 10. Okay. Do you wash the pre-softener out of the color right, or, or go right over it? You go right over it. Yeah. So when you pre-soften with color, you can apply right over the top of it. That's why you make sure that it's at least two levels lighter and it's a warm shade. It sets the hair up for great success. Uh, do you know what volume peroxide comes in box color? Are they all the same? Uh, they're all pretty much the same. I think they're mostly 20 volume. Some may have 10 volume uh, based upon what the how they're describing the product itself. But for the most part, they're all somewhere, you know, 10 to 20 volume that are used. None of them really have 30 volume that I know of. Um, none of them really have 40 volume. Uh, I think the blonding kits might have 30 volume. I don't think they're dealing with 40 volume. But usually 20 volume is pretty much the standard. It's the standard pretty much universally with everything. I get nervous when a stylist says, I mix more than four different tubes. Amen. Me too. I'm a salon owner, and when they say four different tubes, I start counting up the cost per ounce <laughs> per application. Um, but it happens, you know, because we want to be creative. You know, that's, our, that's the reason we got into this business. We want to be creative. But sometimes, in the effort to be creative, we don't think about what we're actually creating. Um, so let's step outside of hairdressing, and let's talk about art. You know, people like Pablo Picasso and, you know, Van Gogh and Renoir and all of those artists of the 19th century, 18th and 19th century. One thing that they knew is they understood whether or not there was linseed oil in the paint or whether it had whale oil. There was a difference between paint with whale oil finished and paint with linseed oil finished. They understood whether they were painting on canvas or painting on stone or painting on metal. They understood all this, so they had to understand the canvas that they were working on plus how their product worked. In our industry, a lot of times we, we do the service, we actually apply color, but we're not sure what's happening. And so when a color starts to go, I call it sideways, when a color starts to go sideways, we're not sure how to work with it or how to correct it. And I think that was a missing part in school. Uh, and most of us really then learned everything we know about color after we got out of school. And unfortunately, when you learn from manufacturers, they're only going to teach you how to use their product. That's it. And that's really all that they're responsible for. They're not responsible to teach us to be great colorists. They're responsible to teach us how to use their product to achieve success. So we have to really find resources that will help us understand the world of hair color so we can color hair with anything and um and i believe that if you're a savvy colorist you can color hair with any color it's just understanding how those products work uh i've used five stroke o six stroke o saturday for that reason yes great erica so if I have a resistant gray, can I use a level 9G to pre-soften, then use my target shade of an 8? Um, yeah, you probably could with a 9 and an 8, because a 9's got very little pigment in it, uh, but it's got enough alkalinity, it'll pre-soften for you. And then your 8 is going to give you coverage. Absolutely, you could probably do that without a problem. All right. So we got all the questions. Do I personally ever use Malibu Direct Eye Lifter? 
or CPR <clears throat> when you do color corrections when I bleach is necessary or do I only use bleach okay great question uh, I don't use CPR but I do use other color extractor products and um, I use color extractors and I use bleach depending on what I'm trying to achieve a color extractor is going to simply break or cleave the couplers that hold your dye intermediates together so it's going to they say shrink it that's that's what that, that's what the marketing story is it's going to shrink it so it's slightly going to disconnect those coupling agents so now your color is that it's no longer a dye molecule that's why once you do that you really don't see color any longer because all the intermediates have been broken down and then when you wash that out okay and then you test it with peroxide to see if it continue if something oxidizes again if it does you do a second treatment okay I use color extractors on hair that is let's say not in great condition because I don't want to use a hydroxide which is a bleach it's a decomposing product because unless the hair is really healthy bleach is going to to destroy everything I think I was talking to my friend uh, Julie the other night about that and we were trying to create a visual and we said like using a color extractor is like putting a doorstop in the door so the door doesn't close completely you put a doorstop in it okay using a bleach or a hydroxide is like taking out the whole door so the quality of the hair would determine which one I would want to use also my final goal if my final goal was to lighten the hair several levels lighter than it is I would probably go ahead and use uh, a lightener because I'm gonna go there anyway uh, if I'm just trying to move the hair a couple of levels or trying to clean up the color then I would use a color extractor Okay, Julia has a great video on the color extractor. Yes, she certainly does. Uh, all right. So, look, I've been here quite a while now, I guess. Um, thanks so much for uh, being on with me tonight. Hopefully you found this beneficial. Um, I invite you to come to our website, www.gurunation.net. We are a non-branded um, professional educational company for salon professionals. Uh, we offer tons of classes, uh, non-branded classes. I don't care what hair color you use. It's about helping you be more successful. Julie and I just did a uh, hair color boot camp, a two-day boot camp online just a few weeks ago. The response has been so uh, outstanding that we have now set uh, for our next boot camp. And it will be, I think it's January 10th and 11th of 2021. Uh, we only take a, a small group of attendees. Uh, it's all done online. And so it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can watch us. And uh, we do all types of visuals, all types of visual experiments to help uh, tie everything in for you. And uh, it's really a great program. We also still offer Formulation Foundation every month and Formulation Mashup. If you're interested in those, you can go right now to Facebook to Guru Nation and it will list the dates for those upcoming programs. And then um, next year, we're gonna be doing a lot. It seems like we'll be doing a lot of digital education. So stay with us. If you found this beneficial, tell your friends about it. But most importantly, thank you all so much for your support. Thank you for being with me tonight. And uh, I wish you all a happy Monday evening. From my heart to yours, I'm Captain Color. I'm out. I'll see you guys. Have a great night. Bye-bye.